This chapter, called the love chapter, perhaps has some of the most beautiful words written in all of Scripture. And they sound perhaps like our heart feels in a moment in which our hearts cry out with love at first sight, or, or the moment in which we realize that we are in love. It's no wonder that the scripture is most commonly read at weddings. But where does it meet the real hurts of the world? The times between the great celebrations, where the rubber meets the road, per se. What does it say to the exhausted, to the lonely, the divided, the one who feels as though they've been chewed up and spit out, feeling without love and purpose? What does it say to the one that is still in love, who, who is still enjoying that experience? What does it say to the ones who don't know, who are just kind of numbly walking through life? Love meets us all. Those who come to this week with anticipation and hope, those who come with sorrow, anger, or dread, those in between, showing us that which is more real than anything we feel on Valentine's Day, a God who, according to Scripture, is love. This God who created love created life itself and considers humanity to be the best of all creation. In Genesis 1, everything is called good except for people, and they're called very good. And this is the God who loves you the way that you are, the way that you were created to be, even if you don't love yourself. This is the God who longs for you to experience the joy of being compassionate, generous, and passionate. This is the God who longs to live in eternal relationship with you. God is true love and true life. But sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? And those feelings, whether they're positive or negative as we've labeled them, those feelings are a good gift from God. Sometimes my best friend has to remind me of that. Because sometimes when I call her and I'm upset, I'm like, can't I just be Spock? Anybody know who Spock is out there? Spock? Spock? Spock from the original Star Trek series, he's a Vulcan who doesn't experience emotion in the way that we do. Sometimes we kind of wish that we could just get rid of all those negative emotions. But yet God has given us all of our emotions as a good gift. And God reaches out to us in love, regardless of whether we're feeling that ooey gooey, warm emotion or perhaps the the heat of anger or perhaps that coldness of feeling empty god calls out to us god reaches out to us in love the thing is that while this text is absolutely beautiful and very appropriate for weddings that's not what it was written for originally it was actually written to a church that was having a hard time getting along with itself the church in corinth around 54 ce was divided They had all kinds of disagreements. They disagreed about what to eat. They disagreed about what type of relationships were sanctioned. They disagreed about socioeconomic status. And their culture encouraged self-promotion. So many in the church were seeking their own individual good, using everything that God had given them selfishly. Being selfish is the opposite of love. I think about what happens when someone we love is hurt. What do we want to do? We, we want to make it better, right? Sometimes we even look at someone that we love as hurting, and we wish that it was happening to us instead of them. Anybody else ever feel that? We wish that we could deal with that pain rather than having the person that we love deal with it. That's what Christ does for us on the cross, right? Goes through the pain goes through that sorrow in a way that releases us from many of the consequences. I think about how this congregation was focused on that and how they were were bearing the fruits of animosity, jealousy, and harm, rather than those things that are called the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
they were seeking to show off their abilities and gifts. And that's why Paul says it doesn't matter how much or how well you can speak. It all, if you are not loving, becomes a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. They believed that showing off would draw people in, but instead the arguments were pushing people away. So Paul encourages them to a true love, an agape love. See, in Greek we have more than one word for love. They don't have the problem that we have. In English we can say, I love pizza, I love my spouse, and I love my friend, right? They're all the same verb, but yet the ways in which we love them are very different. We don't want to love them the way that we love food or they will disappear, right? These three loves mentioned are eros, phileo, and agape. Eros, that erotic love, phileo, that love of brother and sister or friendship or familiar love, and agape, which is that self-giving love. It is that self-giving love that is featured in this text. And in some ways, that's obvious. I mean, if we were to go in and to replace that word, love is, with those things that we love, it wouldn't make sense. I mean, think about it. Pizza is patient. Pizza is kind. Pizza is not envious or boastful. It's, It's totally absurd, right? But when we think about God as love, what does it tell us about God if we say, God is patient, God is kind, God is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, God does not insist on God's own way. God does give us free will. God does reach out to us in love over the entire course of our lifetime and even beyond. And God is the one who shows us this love that is a more excellent way. If we had started just one verse earlier, we would have seen that Paul calls this loving a more excellent way, a more excellent love. For Paul knew what many of us know. We know that even when we say that we love someone unconditionally, even when we intend to love someone unconditionally, even when they intend to give it to us, unconditionally that love that so often there are boundaries that we don't see at first. I think about a child jumping into the deep end of a pool. It feels like there's no bottom, right? But then as they grow older and perhaps they jump a little bit harder, they eventually find the bottom of that pool. Sometimes when our relationships are tried, we find that edge where it's just so hard to love someone or they find it so hard to love us. Sometimes it's because things didn't turn out the way that we expected it to be. We didn't know the height and the depth and and the knowledge fully of who that person is. For we can't know each other in the way that God knows us. We don't know exactly how many hairs, with very few exceptions, we don't know how many hairs are on the person we love's head. We know their name, but we don't know every intricate detail about them, but neither do they, not the way that God does. But yet Paul prays for the people that he loves at Philippi, his church at Philippi, that they will grow in their knowledge and in their love. In Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, we see this. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from this day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. You hold me in your heart. That's a way of saying that you love, right? You hold me in your heart. And so he's saying that he's with this congregation. He's writing to them, and they love him, and he's going to write back and further to them. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. He longs for them with compassion. 
That word that gets translated compassion is actually the word smochnoi in Greek, and it's that feeling that you get in your stomach when you're separated from someone you love. Anybody know that feeling or when something bad happens to him? This is the way that Paul feels about this church at Philippi, that he feels so connected to them that when they're separated, he feels it in his body. So with this love, he says, this is his prayer for them, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless. You see, he wants them to expand the edges of that love. He wants them to know God more fully and to know each other more fully so that that love will not end. It can be hard sometimes when we find out that someone is not the person we thought they were. Or perhaps that we are not the person that we think we are, whether it's in friendship or in families and churches or in a significant other relationship. Sometimes we love someone as they were when we met them, but they or both have changed. And it's then that we hear this call to grow deeper in love, to grow deeper in knowledge, to get to know each other, to get to know God better once again. For when God calls us to a more excellent and long-lasting love, it is a love that is grounded and rooted in God's love. John wrote about this in 1 John chapter 4. He says, Dear friends, let us love each other because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. It's like that valentine that I shared with the kids. That valentine that John 3.16 is. That sacrifice, that loving sacrifice that God has given us. And that God has called us to love each other in loving sacrifice. In this text, we read that love originates from God, not from that excellent feeling that we got seeing someone across the room, or though that feeling, too, is a gift from God. It's not the love of our friends. It's not because we have common goals and interests. It's because that love came from God. That love of family is not from blood or from fostering or from adoption. That love came from God for all good. The good gift of love comes from God. And our God... Our, our loves are much healthier when we keep God at the center. I think about it this way. When two people are fighting whatever sort of relationship they have and they're, they're staring at each other, they see all the things they don't like about each other. Maybe that's just me when I'm mad at somebody. This is what we see. But if we're able to look up to God and to look and to draw closer to God, then these two people who seem so far apart, if they're focusing on moving closer to God, what happens as they move closer to God? They also move closer to each other. They also move closer to each other, and they begin to focus on things that are more important than perhaps that argument about what, what you want to do next or what your particular political affiliation is or perhaps the fact that somebody leaves their socks on the floor all the time or they forget to call you or they only call you when they need money. We begin to draw closer to God and closer to one another and closer to that love that God created us all to share. When we focus on drawing closer to God and in seeing ourselves as God sees, the other, God sees us, we can also begin to see the other person more in the ways that God sees them. We can develop that patience. I think about this, this text where it says that love is patient, and that Greek word there, it, that it gets translated patience. It comes from that word macrothumal, and it means that it's being slow to avenge an offense. Now, it can be fun sometimes when somebody offends us to go tit for tat, right? But that doesn't work well in a long-term relationship, to continually go tit for tat unless it's like just a playful way. And so we're called to have a love that is patient, but not only patient, but kind. 
a love that's not envious because jealousy can quickly harm relationships because we want what another has. And jealousy is the opposite of pride, so you have to find that middle ground. You can't think that what you have or who you are is better. You need to find the goodness in each other and ground that goodness in God. For both envy and pride cause harm along the way, just like both potholes and raises in the road can get in the way. I remember a couple that I spoke with years ago as I was being trained to prepare couples for marriage. I decided that, yes, I was taking the classwork on how to do the premarital counseling, but I wanted to talk to some couples that knew, some ones who had been married for 30 years or more who knew where the rubber hits the road. And so I went and I interviewed this couple, Kay and Bob. I'm still friends with Kay. Bob has gone on to be with Jesus. And, but I remember the first thing that they said to me. I asked him how many years they had been married. It was about 37. If you know me, you know numbers are not my strength, but it was more than 30 and less than 40. And the first thing they said to me was, this is our third marriage. And I thought, okay, because I've known some couples that have divorced and then remarried themselves. And or I thought, is this your third marriage? Like you were both married twice? I mean, they didn't seem old enough to really add that up. And they said, no. We stayed married on paper the whole time, but we had to renegotiate our relationship multiple times. So we've had three different marriages. And the three marriages have all been fulfilling, but that this relationship takes work. It happens in friendships, too, where we can get into arguments, and then we need to redefine that friendship. And so I think about that, about the way that couples, the way that long-term friendships, the way that long-lasting family relationships have to be redefined. But I want to pause for a moment when I encourage people to redefine and to continue and to focus on God, and I want to clear up some possible confusion. Because while this couple redefined their relationship several times and had a long, happy, healthy marriage, it doesn't mean that if you had a marriage or relationship end, that you are in any way less in the eyes of God, or that you should stay together with someone no matter what, because God does not mean for people to be in abusive relationships. God does not mean for us to live in fear of the ones who say they love us. Do people hurt us sometimes? Yes. But there's a difference between unintentional hurt that is temporary an intentional harm, which is not, which is consistent over and over again. And I want you to know that if you ever need someone to talk to about that, that I'm here, and that the number in the bulletin of the National Domestic Abuse Hotline is there. It's 1-800-799-SAFE, and their text number is 88788. It's something that we are keenly aware of, especially this time of year with the correlation of the Super Bowl and Valentine's Day. Love calls us to grow into more than what we once were. Love calls us to create new life, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. And all good creation is an outgrowth of God's love. God's love grows beyond God's self, and it's more than a feeling. It is a verb. It is a decision, an act of will, not only within couples, but in friendships, families, churches, and especially in that greatest story of love where Jesus chose to give his life for us. It happens in unexpected ways. In the Old Testament, we read a beautiful love that grows between a mother and a daughter-in-law where they stay together through thick and thin, helping one another after the loss of the son slash husband. We see it in strong friendships like, like David and Jonathan. We see it between parent and child and between lovers. God's love is a gift. And all good love on earth grows from that gift. God chose to create us. God chose to love us. 
And God reminds us that love never ends. That's one reason this text is not only appropriate for a wedding or for a Sunday beside Valentine's Day, but also appropriate for a funeral. To remind us that that gift of love is stronger than death. That love does not end. God's love for us is eternal. And that that gift of love remains with us. So I want to encourage us. I want to encourage us to keep on loving. To keep on living. To keep on pursuing that agape love, to thank God for those loves that are eros and phileo, but to move towards that agape love, that love that God teaches us, that there is no love greater than one that gives life for their friends. Thanks be to God for the gift of life, and thanks be to God for the gift of love. Amen.